Okay, so OpenOCD. Um, presentation is all about OpenOCD. Um, most of the folks who are familiar with PyOCD, OpenOCD, most of the folks have been working with microcontrollers. The world has changed quite a bit with heterogeneous systems, and we'll be talking about a lot more about what those challenges are. There's a standard solution, a way of doing things, and there is our way of doing things here. So, sorry, marketing team is paying for the money, for the flight, so I've got to do this. TI, we love doing everything in upstream, um, and this entire presentation has been merged in mainline. Um, so all the patches, you're, you're not carrying any of the patches at all. So, and you can replicate this. Uh, we are part of a lot of foundations. Um, though OpenOCD doesn't have quote-unquote Linux foundation umbrella and underneath it, we do contribute quite a bit into it as well. My co-author, Jason, um, unfortunately he couldn't make it here due to some personal reasons. But we are both um, from TI, we've been with TI 20 plus years now, uh, on an average. He's the hardware architect who has been involved with um, uh, hardware debug subsystem for quite some time. I'm the software guy, and this is very typical in TI where we two work very closely to come to a solution. Anyway, so some standard disclaimers. Please don't ask on the TI support forum, what is OpenOCD, why did Nishan say this? Don't get me in trouble, please. So the standard disclaimers that come out. Um, None of this presentation is an official strategy statement from TI. It is just my personal pet project that is running around. Uh, I know many of our systems do have DSPs in, in them, C7, C6, AI engines in them. Um, I know theoretically it is possible to make it work with OpenOCD, but we are not going to cover them. We are going to stick purely with ARM. It's easier to discuss. Um, the last one, unfortunately, I've been debating quite a bit. How simple do we go in the presentation? How complex do we go? So the depth is very subjective. Um, if you look at the, um, the schedule, I did put some intro videos in that I had done for the rest of the team. That might be a good way to get started if you are not comfortable with OpenOCD whatsoever. Like if you have not worked on JTAG, that'll be a great place to get started with. I'm not going to go too deep into the basics. I'll start stepping into the middle there, but I will not go too deep into open OCD either. So it's kind of somewhere in the middle. We'll touch on a little bit of, you know, introduction, what this thing is all about, what, what documentation should you read to understand a little more deeper, uh, what videos you can watch, understand the key concepts a little bit. Um, but I'll try to avoid going deep here, okay? Um, the real talk is about how to make open OCD work in heterogeneous systems, and I'm going to focus on that. Okay. But please feel free to ask questions. Stop me at any time and clarify if you need. Um, but there's, there's quite a bunch of data that we need to share around. All right, so <clears throat> why? Uh, I love the standard answer because I can. Um, for folks who have used Raspberry Pi inside a case, having to open the case up, plug in JTAG just so that you can start doing debugging, is not a pleasant experience. So I like to sit on my couch. I like to work my stuff from my couch. Um, and more importantly, when microcontrollers started becoming um, a realm of open source development, like when Zephyr started getting in our interest area, one of the core questions I had was, why can't I do Zephyr programming like how application developers do? You know, GCC A.C, GDB A.out, and hey, I'm debugging stuff. Why does it work that way? Why do I need this fancy hardware to do stuff? So we were thinking about it, Jason and I, we threw some ideas around. And then within TI, we have this hackathon that we do once a year. It's a 24 hour stress cycle for us, but they let us do anything we like to do. So we're like, hey, let's go and do this. And we made it happen back in 22. It took us a year to get it upstream, but it's there. But that's how this project all came together. The idea is to make microcontrollers no different from any other subsystem that you're developing on. So if you're doing bare metal programming or you're working with free RTOS, for example, or Zephyr, you should be able to build it on the target, deploy it, get your debug, cycle all over again. And you don't need any specialized hardware for doing it. Now, there are constraints, of course. We'll talk through the constraints, but that's the intent here. Now, I know my friends and other associate vendors 
you know, SOC companies also have these capabilities to different levels, but keep in mind, not everybody is equal. So this experience might be very unique to TI, or it may be possible on, let's say, NXP or ST systems too. Just a heads up. I've not tried them, so let me know if it works. All right. So some basics, I said. What is heterogeneous processors? This is a scary picture for people who are used to microcontrollers. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to give you nightmares here. Uh, this is TDF4 VM. Um, the TI product numbers are crazy, but this is one of our beetle bone AI64, if you guys are familiar with that. This is the chip that is on it. It's got like gazillion R5s on it, M4s, A72s, all working in conjunction in a single system. The traditional way of working in this environment is typically you would use code composer studio. Oh, there are DSPs too, I forgot to mention that. But I will not talk about DSPs, I promise. Uh, the traditional way of working in these systems is, oh, if you're Linux, there's a Linux way of development, right? You use, you know, whatever, Yocto, Debian, whatever your poison of choice of distribution. And then there is this black hole world of RTOS development. They love their JTAG. I'm yet to see an RTOS developer who doesn't have JTAG on his desk. But I'm yet to see a Linux developer who has JTAG on his desk too. Um, as most of my Linux colleagues keep on telling me, Nishant, not everybody likes JTAG. But try doing that when your DDR is not working. Hmm, that'll be hard to get a printout. out. Anyway, there are three different types of processors on this SOC. Cortex A's, which is your big application processors. Cortex R's, which is your real-time microcontroller. Uh, for the people who are involved with FUSA, uh, functional safety thingy, um, these Cortex R's can run as lockstep processors, so two processors running together. And then you have your Cortex M, which is a power efficient microcontroller doing the little things on the side. Um, this entire coordination of multiple things talking among themselves, it's like an orchestra. Uh, it, it, it's actually a magic when you see this thing actually working. If you come over to a TI demo, there are a few demos that we showcase how this thing actually works. And we work with um, the OpenAM community to actually standardize the interfaces so that we from TI are not unique. Xilinx, AMD, NXP, ST, all of us are working together to standardize this communication interface. Why do you need heterogeneous systems? Because the old story of one single processor architecture trying to do everything simultaneously is not economical. You can't get your power numbers proper, you can't get your performance, and you can't get everything done in a single processor either. This is the wave of, wave of the future. Everybody who has tried to fight this ended up here in one way or the other. Look at your AI engines. Gosh, everybody likes NVIDIA nowadays, don't you? You don't look for an ARM processor that does GPU along with the processor anymore. Anyway, JTAG by itself, it stands for Joint Test Action Group, which is not a you know cool terminology, but it is like any electrical engineer, any embedded guy knows this stuff in the back end. Uh, it's a daisy chain bit flow, so you inject one zero one zero down the input, you get output, and there's a parallel clock that runs along it, uh, and you can talk to different what we call as test access points, uh, and tap is your interface into the processor. There's a beautiful part two. I wish he finished his part three, but so far part two, uh, article on Medium by Alexander that actually talks through how this works, how does it physically work, and he gives you some beautiful diagrams to explain this. Again, from my perspective, I think it's a little too basic, but from our thought process, think if you have to work with uh, hardware debugging, on a microcontroller which does not yet have a firmware loaded on it. Your step number one is to start talking to the processor, right, before you can see what has gone on. That is only possible with JTAG. It's very fundamental in our system. Core site is another terminology you will hear. Uh, if Matthew Poitou was around, he's in the uh, He's like the demigod of core site support in Linux kernel. He's been doing that for quite some time. Nowadays, he works on remote proc. But core site is essentially the debug architecture uh, ARM evolved to over the number of years to standardize how do you talk to a processor. There are certain registers that are involved, but it uses the same standard JTAG uh, terminology. 
How do you lock step? How do you stop a processor? How do you set a breakpoint? How do you set a watch point? The standardization for, for it. In fact, you, can, you have uh, Linux kernel also supporting that too. Like when you enable KGDB, the stuff in the back end that can enable this, this for you. Um, again, there's a lot more documentation around it. There's a specification called uh, ARM debug interface version five, which would be very interesting to read as well. <sighs> now we come to the fun stuff, Obanosity, <laughs> my favorite topic. Uh, it's a very exciting group of bunch of people here, very typical open source community of characters, and OpenOCD has its characters. They just love electrical signaling. Uh, it's, it, it's an insecure debugger, which allows you to get inside the processor and start debugging any processor that you want. Um, if you were a security guy, this is your nightmare tool. Uh, you want to block this guy from ever talking to your processors. Now, if you're a guy who wants to learn stuff, this is your friend. And I look at OpenOCD as my friend. Uh, how to use OpenOCD and what is OpenOCD in the basic form? Uh, I put a couple of videos on YouTube that I had given a talk a little earlier about. But in a nutshell, it's an app which kind of looks like this. I'm sorry, that's an ugly picture of a board. And you can see there's a lot of wires that I need to pull between two different components. You see, I'm a lazy guy. I don't like going and plugging stuff in. But overall, you would have um, any ID of your choice. You like VI, you like Emacs, you like VS Code, pick a poison, right? It, they all talk GDB. So use standard GDB, GDB multi-arch, whatever you like. And then GDB talks to OpenOCD using network socket, some port that you want to talk it to get it to talk to. The traditional way of running OpenOCD is to run OpenOCD on your PC, and your, this OpenOCD talks over USB to a dongle of some sort. Uh, Tampa stands for, anyway, forget it. The Tampa is one of the dongles that are possible. TI also enables something called XDS 110, both of which are supported natively uh, in OpenOCD. Now, if you folks are familiar with Sega tools, right, they, they have good support on OpenOCD too. So, it doesn't matter what tool you're using, they all talk JTAG. The big difference between these are, if you're using FTDI bit banging, well, your speeds are in the tens of megahertz, but if you use a faster, more expensive dongles from Sega, you might hit megahertz range. That'll be the big difference that you'll see. But that's typically what, when people say JTAG, this is the picture that they have in their mind. Now, you can replace this stuff on top. Have folks heard Lotterback here? At least, oh yes, two people, yes, good. Uh, Lotterback, the um, ARM DS5, all these tools essentially come, this is the view that you work with. You can replace that entirely with Lotterback or ARM DS5. This stuff that you see in bottom essentially remains the same. Internally, there is what we call as a debug subsystem. We'll go into a little more detail of how that works down the slides, uh, which routes the communication to either Cortex-A or Cortex-R down. This is a very simplistic view of how this entire scheme works. As you start drilling down, you might need a bottle of aspirin, but we'll get that. All right, <clears throat> any questions so far? For folks who are not familiar with debug, I know there's a lot of questions, uh, but folks with JTAG, any questions with OpenOCD? Okay, let's go in a little more. Uh, what I don't like is the fact that I have to use my PC, I have to use hardware dongles, and if you look at this little picture over here, this cable is what they call as a tag connect cable, okay? Uh, this is Beagle AI64. Um, the way that they reduced the production cost for the board was to reduce the number of connectors on it. So they are using a pogo pin that plugs onto the PCB, so all you need to do is put the test point in a certain way, and boom, you have JTAG connectivity. It's great, except for one little detail. The cost of this stuff is close to 100 bucks. I don't want to pay 100 bucks for debugging a $200 board. That's 50% of my board cost right there. I don't want to do that. Plus, I have to physically move my body, <laughs> plug the cable in, and actually use it for doing my stuff. So we don't want anything physical in this picture. And that's where we start using memory. So there's quite a bit of benefits out of this thing in the approach that we took. 
when you're talking electrical signals, you are um, slave to what electrical routing you can get out of the system, what rate of bit banging you can do with FTDI. What if you were to remove all of that? You could talk at processor speed, at bus speed. Your debug is like super fast. And that's what we ended up seeing. And we didn't anticipate it initially. I mean, we were not thinking that this thing is going to be beautiful. Like, what's going on? This is so fast. I'm like, oh, that's why. You also can get to debug remote cores, uh, all the R5s. And if we need, we can get to DSPs if you want to. Uh, but in this solution, what we have done, yes, you need to run OpenOCD somewhere. We run it on the A53 within the SOC itself. So you're running OpenOCD on A53 using the SOC bus to communicate to the debug subsystem and then using that to control the R5s. That's the nutshell of this entire story. How we do is a little more interesting detail. But the good part of that is once you run OpenOCD, guess what? You can run VS Code on the target if you like, or you can run VS Code on your desktop. It doesn't know the difference because it's all network sockets at that point. You can run SMP. You can enable RTOS awareness. Everything was seamlessly out of the box. So, yes, let's talk about negatives. Uh, we being lazy, we decided to use slash dev mem. Uh, and I remember there were experiences of production devices that exposed dev mem, uh, which uh, was not pretty, so I'm sorry. <laughs> But we couldn't think of anything better or easier to use. Slash term mem was very easy. But if you are rolling your own distributions, you can probably control this, uh, the kernel.config, which allows dev mem, and you disable the strict dev mem access. But if you are using something like a production OS, like um, let's say Red Hat, uh, CentOS, for example, they're very, very strict about this stuff. They actually lock these down. And you will probably not have access to it. But if you're using Yocto, most of the Debian distribution, you're probably okay. If you can roll out your own kernel, you are still okay because you can enable this on your own. This is kind of a little bit of a gotcha though. And the other gotcha is that I'm assuming none of you guys are using root to work on your board. I think you are. Okay. Uh, if you are using root, please don't. Uh, please use sudo to get when you want to. Uh, so you need to be in the sudo user. Uh, to be able to actually run OpenOCD and get to the dev mem. The actual build of OpenOCD is straightforward. This is a standard build. You just run dot .bootstrap. There's a lot, bunch of Git modules that it start dragging in, run dot .configure. The big stuff is enable dmem. So we debated it a little bit on get it. Well, they do their reviews in get it. It still exists. Um, and the thought was that DMEM doesn't make sense for 99% of the platforms. Maybe TI platforms and maybe a few people beyond TI might start using it. So it has to be explicitly enabled and most of the standard distributions you'll get out of either Debian or any of the folks will probably not have this enabled by default. So just a heads up on it. And then you do a make install and you're usually done. One interesting thing that you want to keep in mind is that Unlike building OpenOCD on uh, PC, most of you folks are probably embedded developers, which means you probably use Yocto, I hope. Yes, uh, you may have to customize your recipe a little bit. So you can, uh, wrong key, go back up, there we go. I've kind of given a hint how to build it for Yocto with the extension, so you can use your package config, dmem, minus minus enable dmem, and do a, do a plus equal to dmem. Uh, Meta OE recipe is your reference, so you can do a BB append to extend that further. Um, and you can kind of roll out your own distro with DMEM enabled OpenOCD. Uh, it's not too hard for folks who are a little comfortable with recipes. Uh, but if you're not, use Debian, dot .configure, make, you're good to go. You get the same thing. So once you start OpenOCD up, this is how the log looks like. And this is what a heterogeneous system looks like. The, I took a different processor for this example. We took an example. This is actually the simplest processor in TI's K3 family. Uh, we just have four A53s and an R5 and an M4. Uh, most of our pro processors have much more complexity in the system. So 
A53s are running in SMP mode. Uh, they are running Linux. R5 is running free RTOS, and Zephyr is running on M4, in my case. So when you run the, this configuration, SWT native, so we kind of emulated single wire debug and called it native. So it's, it's actually, if you're technically correct, this is very wrong. Uh, because there's no physical single wire debug coming into play at all, okay? But that's the term that we kind of overrode and we kind of hacked around that path. It was the easiest way through. So when you, this configuration file is available upstream uh, with an open OCD. So if you run this command, you'll see these ports open up. Each of these ports directly talk to a processor. Now there's a configuration that you can do where all these processors are grouped together in SMP configuration. There's a hardware thread concept in open, I mean, in open OCD that allows you to do that. For our interest, we are talking GPMCU, which is the M4, and if you connect to port 339, you get to here. You can start loading your Zephyr images, you can start debugging it. So, this is interesting, because the moment this port is opened up, Rust starts to behave nicely. Zephyr starts to behave nicely, because you can do um, VEST build, VEST test, if you're using cargo, cargo run starts working, everything seems seamless, as if you're running a native application. It was surprising, I mean, it's pretty cool to see it work. Um, and if any of you guys want to actually see the demo, I have it at my booth, you can come along, I can show you how it works out. Little more complex setup, right? Now you add uh, networking access. So I don't want actually, my ID, I want on my laptop, the board is sitting here, it's connected on Wi-Fi, but I want to debug it from my desktop. I mean, on my laptop, sitting around. So you can enable, and please be careful, if you're on home network, this is probably fine, but if you're on Starbucks network, this is probably not good. Uh, I kind of opened it up to all the ports, so please do a SSH tunnel next time if you want to do it. Uh, but this is the cheapest of all. Just open up the port up, it connects to all interfaces, just connect to the IP, and you're good to go. Uh, this, this is a little custom stuff. Uh, set RTOS variable. There, I'm saying that this processor is Zephyr. So it has now Zephyr awareness available for that processor. I can do a combination. I can run free RTOS and Zephyr simultaneously. So free RTOS running on R5, Zephyr running on M4. Using the same variable, it's an array essentially, named array. Uh, saying that GPU, GPMCU is running Zephyr, main R5 is running free RTOS, and use the same configuration. There's different ways to skin this thing. One thing I would not suggest to do is, since you're running this on A53, please don't use this to debug A53. It's not going to end well, okay? Because you're going to stop OpenOCD debugging, I mean, you get the circular loop coming in. Uh, the, the actual GDB command itself is GDB multi-arch. Uh, it uses XML to communicate with OpenOCD to go and figure out, hey, what kind of processor are you using? Right? Are you ARM64, are you ARM v7, whatever, right, RISC-5. It, by talking to the port, it automatically talks in the back end. Now, this is a very trivial implementation. I mean, this is like bare metal development stuff. Most of you folks who are going to work on Zephyr will probably wrap this under your VEST commands. Right. West does have open OCD communication because that's what microcontroller guys do. And they try to use that from your PC perspective. But you no longer need a PC for development. You can run this from A53. If you're using Rust, you would wrap this under Cargo. Again, there are some Cargo files that I'll show along as well. Anyway, so if you don't know which operating system you're working on, which is maybe, uh, there is an option for you to say, auto, go figure it out. Uh, Open OCD is smart enough to do that too. All right, here's a screenshot that is hardly going to be visible. I have this thing with black, I don't know why. Uh, oh crap, I didn't think it was this bad. Oops, I was supposed to say that. Anyway, so this is the code, this is the actual driver code. What I have here is a GDB dashboard, uh, actually debugging M4F. Uh, on this side, I have Open OCD running. This is just debugging one processor, okay? And then I have Lotter back IDE, okay? The guy who needs the specialized hardware, but he also knows how to talk GDB. So this could have been DDD, VS Code, anything of my choice. So this is debugging the M4. So you have two different debuggers running simultaneously with no JTAG hardware. 
I'm actually debugging this sitting on the side on the M4 with Zephyr in this. Was it Zephyr? I think it's Zephyr. This was bare metal code that I was running over here. Let's make it a little more interesting. Rust, of course. Let's forget about the little CVE episode we had a few weeks back. I was learning Rust, so the code is like really bad. Uh, but here's an example of cargo run actually working. So you can run stuff on, so I'm running cargo on A53 here, and OpenOCD is connected on a second terminal, two SSH terminals, and guess what? The guy is sitting and debugging code on M4. It doesn't even appear that I'm sitting and running a microcontroller. I feel that I'm running a native app at this point. This is how I feel I should develop. I don't want this special magic stuff to do. And it's pretty fast, and which is, I like to iterate, I'm not a designer per se. I don't like designing everything and then running things, make a lot of mistakes and get to the perfect solution. This kind of works for me. Okay, so some things that you have to be careful. Now this is uh, generic um, stuff that we have to be careful about anyway. Uh, if you are on heterogeneous system, you have to be careful about watchdog because hey, we are hardware, we like watchdogs. If you don't pet the watchdog, it's going to come and bite you. Um, there are different techniques on uh, K3 architecture, how to prevent the watchdog from biting you. If you're writing serious firmware, you probably are playing with watchdogs. Uh, but initial days, stay off watchdog. Uh, some standard stuff, like you just made the change, you're reloading and rerunning. You expect the register to be 0x1 set, but you end up with 0x3, because in the last run you set two, this time you're adding one on top of it. Few other TI specific problems that we have. Uh, we have a device manager because the system is so complex and you can see this in most of the newer SOCs. Uh, the power management itself, there's a microcontroller doing power management. So that role is now central for everybody else who have become slave, including the A53s or A72s you have in the system. So you need to talk to that guy to get anything done. So you suddenly are talking to an IP and boom, exception. Why? Clock is not enabled. The third, last caveat that we have is that we are, we, I consciously chose not to write TCL scripts that will directly go and bit bang into registers and enable a processor. Primarily because the reset vector is a security domain. I don't even get to see it. So you need to use TI SCI APIs uh, or you know, PSCI APIs or SCMI API, whatever your favorite poison is, to actually set what the reset vector of the processor is. The VBAR, reset VBAR, whatever you want to call it. I don't have direct access into that. So that has been one of my challenges, and I depend on remote proc to do that work for me, including memory carve outs so that we don't step on each other. All right, are you guys tired yet? <laughs> All right, if not, let's get some pain in the story. That's the actual debug hardware architecture, insights, okay. Uh, you will see a variant of this on different SOC. Now, I've taken a very simple SOC, AM625. If I were to take a TDF4 VM, it's going to be much more complex than this. Over here is your normal interface that is coming in, the JTAG interface, and there are multiple routes into the SOC for the processor. So the one that we will be interested in is this little guy with the ugh, R5 and the M4 over here. These are the two guys that we were showing examples of. All right, this entire story is to bypass hardware, right? So what we want is to disable this thing on the side. But we also have to be careful about the way you talk to the hardware. From OpenOCD perspective, he thinks it needs to talk to hardware. It doesn't know that I'm emulating the hardware signals coming through. So I need to plug into the right layer in OpenOCD to be able to get the calls coming in from the processor target and route it as memory accesses downstream. So there are two things that we ran into. One thing is that like for M4, it was pretty cool. I could do an access port, direct access port remapping and it just worked. But for the R5s, I had difficulty. I had to actually emulate an access port itself. So this is how we kind of did for uh, M4. The data path from the SOC address goes via this one to the AHP AP and boom, you're good. You can talk to M4 all day long, no problem. No software emulation reader. Need a direct register read write, you're good to go. R5 wasn't the same. We actually had to create an emulated access port, which means we, we act as if 
this hardware, or rather this AP, AP, APB AP exists. So we emulated an APB AP in software. Now we are not the first to do it. This is not science that we discovered. Apparently other people have done the same. So we cheated, we stole. So this is overall the software architecture of OpenOCity. There's a lot of dependency diagrams in terms of how the JTAG helpers work, RTOS and target interfaces. Long story short, the SWD, there is a way to override it and kind of emulate SWD in OpenOCity, which is what we chose as a route. Um, time check. How am I doing? Okay, 10 more minutes, I think. All right, so uh, internally, DMEM has two implementations. I mean, the source is available. Uh, you can look at upstream OpenOCity code. Uh, there's a little bit of Doxygen documentation around it, but hey, who needs documentation, right? Um, so there are two memory maps that it maps out. One for direct AP access. Uh, so you have the access port access for M4, for example. You give direct access to OpenOCity, and he's perfect. The other one that we have is emulated. For the R5s, we had to emulate an access port. So the register access, it, OpenOCity talks, tap, accesses, we translate those accesses using a state machine into actual register modes. So there's a very tiny state machine that we maintain as well. Uh, basic configuration in OpenOCD, open how to do it. Uh, I have not studied other processor architectures, so I think this should scale to other architectures too. And the reason why I'm very confident is that TI did not do anything magic with CoreSight. We have not customized it in any way. Unless your SOC vendor has customized it, this most probably might work for you too. Uh, the last one was the emulated mode itself. This is the state machine I was mentioning about. The direct AP access is straightforward. The emulation, these are the standard ADI registers that we have to emulate out. In real hardware, they are registered. They have specific offsets that you go and poke into. In our emulation mode, we act as if those registers exist. So you get a tar register offset. Based on the tar register offset, you're doing something in the backend. Um, straightforward stuff, there is control status word. What address do you want to transfer it to? There's data read write. What are you actually trying to do? Then there's bank registers, three, four of them, and configuration base address and identification. Um, this is the base register configuration that we have. In terms of the state that we may manage, we just need to maintain two states. What register was it going? So we need to remember that because the next operation is going to be based on that register offset. And what's the control status word that was asked us to do? So maintain the state of the control status and what register are we going to? With that, the code is not that high, that complex. It's like maybe 100, 200 lines of code. Uh, it's a very straightforward straight mission for it. But with that, you can uh, MMIO emulation um, access as well. But the story doesn't help end, right? Again, I told you, this, this entire thing is a pet project between Jason and me. Uh, we kind of did this in 24 hours. It took us a year to upstream, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but there's a lot more we have to do, yeah. Uh, we stopped at just basic debug. But uh, we could go and enable CTI and trace support. Um, something like embedded trace buffer. What is trace, right? So, so folks who are familiar with JTAG probably know this already. Instead of stepping through every single line of code, you set up a breakpoint, say go, and boom, you have a full trace of every single instruction that you executed till that point. What data structures were changed, you can walk back and forward. There are a lot of ID tools that make a lot of money with that. It's possible to do that in uh, OpenOCD as well, but nobody has invested time to enable that yet. Embedded trace module is a much more sophisticated scheme to get more in-depth trace information as well. There's something called a system trace monitor too. So your bus traffic, you guys have used perf, right? I hope you have. Uh, so you get in-depth knowledge of where the bus traffic is flowing, how much is your bandwidth utilization. What if you could see that at every fabric level, every choke point within the fabric? What is each DMA channel doing? STM gives you that visibility as well. These are things that are standard stuff, and in TI documentation, we publish everything. So, but of course, someone has to take the interest in writing, which we still haven't done. This one is my pet peeve. I don't use VS Code. 
honestly. But I understand there's a lot of VS Code fans. I like VI. Uh, and I respect you guys, right? So I did look a little bit into enabling VS Code, and I found that Maddox uh, has been doing some good works with the device packs for ST. And I was like, oh, what was he doing in the backend? He's been using SVD file formats, and those are huge when I start generating for uh, TI SOCs. So I don't want to put anything like gigabyte of files out there, which don't help. Uh, it'll be nice if you could just click and drag and drop and see the registers of how your GPU looks like without having to do memory map, dump, bit field decode manually. It's possible to do that in VS Code. I just don't know how to do it efficiently. Need some help though. The last little detail which we've been trying to work with OpenIMT team as well is every distribution enables different kernel modules differently. Now, folks who are familiar with device trees know that the probe order, our good friend minus E probe differ, is a very good helper to make sure that your IDs are different for every boot. So what I get on Debian and Yocto tends to be different remote proc IDs. I get remote proc ID 16. On the other one, I will get remote proc ID 4. And I'm like, oops, I have to change my make file again. Uh, I would like to standardize it. I did post a patch which uh, Matthew killed me for. Um, it's aliasing for remote proc. I thought it was trivial, but apparently there's much more deeper questions around it. So need to work on that. Future directions. Um, anybody heard UCIE stuff, chiplets, fancy words stuff? Um, there's a lot of uh, UCI consortium is trying to work on debug subsystem, and they are looking at when your chiplets are integrated for a full SOC, it's very dynamic in, in the nature. So how do you discover this entire system? and still mean without having like hard-coded configuration files. So a lot of work happening on that. And this is probably my pet peeve. RISC-V, guys. Um, we are not part of RISC-V International. Anything I say is my personal opinion, not my company's opinion. Remember the trade-off that I have. ARM has learned to spend a lot of effort over the last 10, 20 years to do this right. RISC-V ecosystem is relearning all the problems all over again. It shouldn't happen. Uh, you can look at their debug specification online uh, in RISC-V. I wish there could be some unification here. I wish we could have the same core site-like standard in RISC-V, which both ARM and RISC-V were to follow. It would help all of us. But this is going to be a very interesting journey. As RISC-V starts maturing, you already have a mature ecosystem to look up to, but you can't copy from. And this is unfortunate. For me, that's one of my saddest things that I have learned looking at this thing. All right, so um, trying to keep to my time. Sorry. Uh, I couldn't have done this without the community. I mean, I started this off one late night, someday, sitting around, um, which is how I start new projects. Uh, a lot of people in the IRC community have helped me through this. Uh, Big thanks to Antonio, Paul. Uh, Beagle community has been a big uh, guinea pig for my team. Uh, I usually throw ideas out there, and there are a couple of guys who like to pitch in. In fact, they added J7 TDF4 uh, VM. Um, Kylin did. And um, Kevin, Fred, Tony, they have worked their magic around on AM65 and J7. Yeah, so that's us. So if you guys like, the stuff that we do in the community for Open OCD. Don't buy me a beer. Don't buy me a coffee. Just donate in. Uh, that's more or less what my quest, my presentation was all about. In nutshell, you can you do not need hardware to do JTAG. Microcontroller heterogeneous programming does not need to be hard and evil. You can use your favorite editor too. Simplifying. Questions, please. Might be out of time now. Okay, so if you guys are interested, there's like tons of backup material you guys can read through. Please go ahead. So have you given any thought about how to uh, debug the A53 core? Is OCD movable to a different cores? I mean, KGDB, gives, core? KGDB gives you that capability already. So okay. nothing extra we need to do there. Now, you can also run the same open OCD 
and again, this is theoretical, since it's POS6 compliant, in theory, we should be able to run OpenOCD on Zephyr from R5 and debug A53. Right, right. That, that's, in theory. Yeah. I right. never tried it yet. It has to be compiled for it, that's all, right? Yes, yeah, that's the exactly. mistake, right? Cool. Thanks. You mentioned the TDA4 VM. That's right. I'm, I'm curious if you've tried it on that chip or that's just a yes. theory it should work. Yes, yes, it does work. Okay. And I have a nice little picture. Oops, sorry. My usual ugly picture to show you that it works. This is on TDA4 VM. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, by the way, this is on 6.9 RC2. Okay. I work with mainline. Jason? Would you do the same for the non-ARM cores and some of these SOCs like uh, C7X? Uh, did no, I miss that said, at the early part of the presentation? We said we won't talk about it. You won't talk about that? <laughs> okay. Sorry, I'm just kidding. Uh, in theory, it is possible. Uh, I'm not going back into the disclaimer section. Uh, in theory, it is possible. Uh, but I'm going to use the same term my imagination colleague uh, used um, in the previous presentation. Let's say it is dependent on the business decision at the moment. Any other questions, folks? All right. Um, I'm available for the day, and you guys can reach me on IRC as well. Um, there's a lot of places. I'm, I'm like a social butterfly nowadays. Um, you can find me on Discord, uh, on Zephyr, OpenAMP, and Beagleboard forums. Uh, IRC, if you like, still people use IRC. If you do, we folks in OpenOCD hang out in liberator.chat. You can find us there. And if you want to reach us on Fediverse or LinkedIn, we are there. Thank you. <laughs>